Do you ever talk to yourself? <laughs> I know I do. In fact, it seems like the older I get, the more I'm trying to find a place. Where are you going to stand, John? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> seems like the older I get, the more I find I talk to myself. And, and the problem is, it's not just talking to myself, it's arguing with myself. That's what more, more I do, you know. There's a piece of cake. Oh, boy, I'd like that cake. No, John, you don't need that piece. Yeah, I do. It really looks good. No, John. So, so I talked to myself. Here's a, you know, I always got to start off with a joke. This one's a cartoon. I'll tell you a little bit before. It's about a guy on a desert island. He finds a bottle floating, you know, the proverbial bottle floating in the ocean, and he opens it, and it says, he looks back and talks to the tree, and he says, it's a joke about a man on a desert island who ends up talking to a tree. He's talking to it. It takes people a little bit here to get. He's talking to the tree, and he found the bottle, and he read it about it. You know, we're forgetting. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be intellectual in order to get this job. This job. <laughs> All right, I got a guy. You know this guy instantaneously. You know this guy. That was uh, that was uh, me in my younger years. Yeah. No. <laughs> You guys know this. This is Gollum, a.k.a. Schmeagol, and he's in the Lord of the Rings. He's the guy that originally found that one ring and started to deteriorate, but he, in the movies, he's helping. He's helping. Uh, I say here, he, Gollum, he, he always talked to himself. Whenever um, they weren't around, whenever Sam and, and, and Sam and, Frodo wasn't around, he would talk to himself. No, I say no, he would argue, he would literally argue with himself. On one hand, he wanted to be faithful and help Frodo out and show him and help him and guide him. And then on the other hand, he would start arguing with himself and he wanted to betray Frodo and steal that ring. It was the epitome of talking to yourself, arguing with yourself. Well, today, we're going to look at a person Somewhat like Frodo, or, or um, Smeagol Gollum, somewhat like Gollum, he's going to be talking to himself, arguing with himself, bawling himself out in today's sermon. All right, we're going to talk about Psalm 42. Let me just give you a little background. We don't know who wrote Psalm 42. Probably... It was David, much fits into David's life, but we don't, we don't know. He was in trouble, and there were several times in Scripture where it really fits into David's life. It could be when David was older, after he'd been king, um, when Absalom's rebellion, you know, that really caused a lot of trouble in David's life. But it could have been earlier in David's life. He was anointed as king, but King Saul was chasing him all over the country, there were times when David and his men were on one side of the mountain and Saul and his men were on the other side of the mountain. There was a time when David and his men to get away from Saul hid in a cave and all of a sudden Saul rides up with all of his troops and Saul says, let's stop here a minute. I need to use the restroom. And Saul gets off his horse and walks up into the cave. David's men cowering, in, you know, so interesting story. David was in trouble, and it could have been written by David. We don't know, though, exactly who wrote it. It was a person who was having some real difficult. I think we can relate to it. You know, the Psalms are such relatable things. It was a man who was going through some hard times, and he began to let his imagination and his emotions run away with him and he began to focus on the problems in his life emotionally he was discouraged downcast is the word that's used in this psalm yet he would talk to himself and he would talk himself out by reminding himself of biblical truth i want to tell you something today it is good to talk to yourself. It is good when your mind is just running and racing for you to stop yourself and literally say, stop it, John, quit it. Don't be doing that. You need to do what is right and tell yourself. We're going to see the psalmist does that in Psalm 42 today. All right, so let's get into it. 
I do not have a, oh, no, I'm, here's, I was talking about it could be in David's life. There was a point in David's life where even though David was running from King Saul, he was still taking his men and he was plundering the Philistines. He was attacking the Philistines. So he was helping fight the Philistines as well as run from King Saul both at the same time. Well, they were out one time and they were, they were battling the Philistines and they came back and there had been a bunch of Philistines that came through that plundered his entire camp. Not only did they take all of their goods, but they talk, took the wives and the children as well. So they come back to the camp and everything is gone. Wives and children and his men. You remember David's men. David's men were good fighters, but you remember they were a bunch of uh, renegades that David had kind of, that had gathered themselves around David. He had men who were troubled with taxes, men who were running from the law, and they kind of joined with David. So David had a ragtag bunch of men and they come back and their wives and their children are gone. Uh, you need to look at this verse. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. I think this verse fits right along with Psalm 42. Here's what this verse says. David was greatly distressed because the men, his own men, were talking of stoning him. They were so upset. Each one was bitter in spirit because his sons and daughters. Notice, notice it doesn't say anything that they were worried because their wives were gone. <laughs> it was only that their sons and daughters were gone. Huh? So they were all upset and they were talking about stoning David, their leader. How could that numbskull David get us into this kind of trouble? We're out raiding the Philistines and they come and they steal all our goods. They steal our sons and our daughters and they steal it. Well, I don't care about our wives, but they, they take everything. And they're talking about stoning David. Notice this last verse. Very important. David got away from his men, sat down. It says, David found strength. Some translations translate that. David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. We're going to talk about how to defeat discouragement in our lives today. David looked to the Lord. All right. I do not have a handout today. I, I didn't get one ready. I have such a... Can I do this, John? Can I do this, John? Um... I got such a complicated, complicated outline that it would be useless to have a handout for it. Here's my, here's my complicated outline today. Verses 1 and 2, words of encouragement. So verses 1 and 2, Psalm 42, are some words of encouragement. All right, it's going to start getting complicated now. Okay, verses 3 and 4 are words of discouragement. Okay, so now he starts talking about how he is discouraged. All right, hang with me. It's going to be rough to, to, hang, to follow this outline. Third point of our outline, verses 5 through 8, words of encouragement. Next point, 9 and 10, words of discouragement. And then verse 11, he winds up the end of the psalm with... Words of encouragement again. I know, I know, kind of complicated outline. I hope you can kind of follow it along with me as we go through it. Okay, so let's start. Five points. I should be out at a good time today. <coughs> Five points. First point, words of encouragement. Now, as you read these and you put them in the context, I'm not sure the psalmist, whether it be David or not, I'm not sure the psalmist thought these were words of encouragement, but we'll, we'll talk about that, okay? Uh, Dan, Dan, you did a marvelous job picking songs, picking songs today. You had Psalm 42 in there, but here, here we are. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O oh God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where, when can I go and meet with God? Now, I've called these words of encouragement. Verses 3 and 4 begin to talk about his troublesome circumstances and stuff. And I think the author thought here that these were words of discouragement. He thought he was kind of complaining as he wrote those. It's a deer who's just panning for water. I don't know, I don't know, any of these men here, you know, November? 
15 is coming around pretty soon. Oh, all the wives say I'm not supposed to talk about that. Yeah, yeah November 15. Yeah, yeah, with Bohan. Yeah. I want you to imagine. Think about this deer just running through the woods, and this hunter is really persistent, keeps trailing him, and he's running. He's already had a couple of shots at him, and he was able to duck, and it hit the tree behind him, and that deer just takes off, and he is thirsty, and he's tired. And, and what is the deer looking for? He's looking for some, some water. He's frantic because that hunter keeps coming after him. This is what the author of this psalm is getting at. This troubles are just wearing me down. I, I'm panting for streams of water. So my soul, here it is, pants for you. Now I have said these are words of encouragement because even though the author may have meant them as words of discouragement, he is looking in the right place. He's looking to the Lord. He's in trouble. His soul is panting for help. And where does he go? He goes to the Lord. So often when we have trouble, we try to handle it ourselves. Or we sit and complain and worry and complain and get downcast. And we don't go to where we should the author says here, as the deer pants for the streams of water, my soul, Lord, is needing your help. Psalmist thirsts for God. David starts off, and I'm assuming it's David, starts off on a positive note. He professes his hunger. Hunger really wasn't in there, really. It was just thirst. But his hunger and his thirst for God, his desire for God. You know, this needs to be in our lives. When we get up in the morning, there should be some kind of a chorus running through our mind about the Lord, and our thoughts ought to turn to the Lord. You've all heard that joke about this guy. He says, Lord, I've done pretty well so far today. I haven't lusted. I haven't stole. I haven't said anything mean to anybody. But in just a moment, I'm going to throw the covers back, and I'm going to get out of bed. And then I'm really going to need you, you know, you know. So our mind needs to turn right away for the Lord. And throughout our day, we need to hunger and desire to have that personal relationship with the Lord in our lives. I was making a practice. I'm going to talk about that in, in just a minute. But um, I was making a practice. I have my devotions in the morning, and I spend time in prayer. And then sometimes in the evening, I get to thinking, and I think, you know what? I, uh, I had my devotions, and I spent time in prayer, and then I got off to work, and I got busy with work, and I did this, and I did that, and there were problems, and I had worries, and I had victories, and I did some good things, and here it is evening, and I think, you know what? I haven't thought about the Lord all day since I had my devotions this morning, and I'll bet you there's a lot of you that are that same way. We need to seek the Lord in our lives and hunger and thirst and desire for a relationship with him. His heart sought after the Lord. So I ask, do you have a hunger and a thirst for that personal walk, that personal relationship with him? If you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are his child. You can have a personal relationship with the Lord. We need to seek that in our lives. Interesting, talking about my devotions this morning. Interesting, Dan, that you had that second song. And if you use Our Daily Bread, radio Bible class based here out of Grand Rapids, and I usually, I use Our Daily Bread. They always had the little booklets. For years and years and years, you get an, you get an opportunity. You ought to read the biography of uh, M.R.D. Hahn, Dr. M.R.D. Hahn. He was a drunken doctor around the area, Byron Center area even, and uh, it, says, it says that many an evening his horse would bring him home because he was too drunk to drive home himself. Then he got saved, and he started Big Calvary Church, and he started Radio Bible Class, and interesting, wonderful, wonderful um, biography of, of him. But 
um, they put out this Our Daily Bread. For years and years, it's been that little booklet. I read it online. You know, I try to be a little techie. Yeah, a techie who can't even figure out how to do the sound on my computer last week. But, but I read it online. This morning, it was on the woman at the well. Yeah, Jesus declared he was the water of life who could quench her thirst. The psalmist says, I thirst thirst for God. All right, let's go on. Now he jumps into words of discouragement. Verse 3, my tears have been my food day and night. In other words, he's crying and crying and crying rather than having a steak or a hot dog or whatever. His tears have been there for him. They're what's sustaining him in life. He says, while men say all day long, where is your God? There's people, there's people who know him. He has lived a testimony for the Lord before them. He has maybe even said something like, well, you know, the Lord can help you with that problem. You know, you need to look to the Lord. He said things like that to all of these other people around him. And now he's in trouble and all of these people who know him are looking at him and saying, ha, where's God now? I thought you said that when you get in, I thought you said that when you get saved, you're never going to have any more problems. No, no, that ain't what I said. That isn't what I said. The Lord can help you in your problems. So they're, they're criticizing him. They're mocking him. Where's your God now? These things I remember. Now his mind wants. So he's, he's having problems. He's, he's crying over these problems. He's got people mocking him and criticizing him for his Christian testimony. And then his mind begins to wander back. He says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul how I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. He thinks back. He thinks back when he used to have good times. Now, this could have been, if this is written by David, this could have been David when he was king, because he's, this is in his past, right? He's leading the multitude. So he may have been king leading them up to the temple. Remember we talked about the, um, the songs of ascent, that they would march as a throng up to the table on their Jewish holy days, and they would worship and sing together. So is it written by David later in his life, maybe when Absalom made him flee, because he thinks back about how he used to lead the people. Another commentator, though, was talking about, well, maybe David, as a young boy who knew how to play the harp, led the throng with his music. We don't know. Might not even been written by David. But he's remembering back how he would, he would lead them, and they'd all be shouting and singing together, and they'd be praising the Lord, and they'd be having a good time. He remembers back when he had those spiritual highs in his life. And, of course, right now he's in the mix of problems. So what's he thinking? Oh, I wish I could be back then with no problems, enjoying the Lord, having a good time with my Christian friends. I wish I was back there again. And his mind is focusing on that. His mind is focusing on the problem. He's crying and crying and crying. His mind is focusing on those people who are mocking him. And his mind is focusing on when his life was a whole lot better and easier and having a good time. Now I'm in the middle of trouble. So then he stops. It is like he stops and he steps out of himself and there he is standing, crying, being a wimp baby. And he says this. Oh, I, I got to go through this. Three things discourage him. His circumstances are rough. Others mock his Christian stand. He remembers the good times with the Lord earlier in his life. He thought, I wish things could be like they used to be. Okay. Now he stops. This is what happened. Words of encouragement. 
Verse 5, he says, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Who's he talking to? Himself. Yeah. He was sitting there being, Oh, oh life is so rough. I got a hard time. People are mocking me. I'm going through real difficulties. And all of a sudden, it's like he steps back and he says, Wait a minute. Look at yourself. Why? Why are you being so downcast, soul, John? Why are you doing that? Why are you? I'm not talking to you. I'm talking, I'm talking to this John. Yeah. <laughs> John, why are you? <laughs> this John. I'm talking to myself. Why are you downcast, oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet Praise him, my Savior and my God. You see what he's doing? He, his, his emotion, often it is said that man is made up of mind, will, and emotion. His emotions before this, in the earlier verses, were controlling him. And they were controlling what his mind was thinking about, thinking back and thinking of the problem. And so his emotions were governing his life. Now, all of a sudden, he stops and he says, Stop it, John. Why are you thinking that way? And his will takes over control. He says, Put your hope in God. Now, if we were to end it there, there's a comma and there's another clause, but let's just take that as a short sentence. Put your hope in God. What kind of a sentence is that? Remember back, remember back when you were what, eighth grade grammar? You had the indicative, which was a statement. You had the interrogative, which was a question. I don't even know if they teach this anymore. You didn't even have you got indicative sentences, you got interrogative sentences, you have exclamatory sentences, but the one that I skipped is the imperative sentence. What is an imperative? A command. Yeah. I like. He is commanding himself, and he uses, what's the pronoun he uses? He uses the word your, you know, he's talking to himself. John, you need to stop being a wimp baby, cry baby about all of the problems you got in your life, and you need to begin to praise the Lord. You need to begin to look at him. You know, that's what we need to do. We need to put our when our emotions get control and begin to govern our life and begin to cause us to think about all of the possible problems and all the worries and all oh, woe is me, our will needs to take over. And we need to stop ourselves and we need to begin to focus on the Lord. Verse 6. My soul is downcast within me. I like this. I like this. I like this translation. Now, the next word is... John, this used to, does this have, this don't have the blazer on it, does it? Is there a laser? Is there a laser on it? Okay. <laughs> Let's see. All right, there, yeah. The next word is therefore. Now, if you think about therefore, therefore is what? It means this is a result of this, okay? So, he says, my soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I'm going to mope around, and I'm going to worry, and I'm going to have a miserable life. That's not what he says. He says, my soul is downcast within me. Therefore, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to change that. I'm not going to let my emotions govern my life anymore. He says, first of all, he says, I will remember you. Now, Here's what I'd like to do. Now, this goes on, talks about Jordan, uh, in the Jordan, the heights of, the, of, of Hermon and the Mount Mizor. I looked at it, what is he talking about there? Some of the commentators are saying Mount Hermon is way to the south end of Israel. Mount Mizor is way to the north end of Israel. So he's talking about all of the land of Israel there. Kind of like the old expression in the Old Testament, from Dan to Beersheba. Beersheba was way, way on the south. And Dan, actually their inheritance was kind of in the middle, but... If you read Judges, there was a spot there where, where Dan was almost all wiped out, the tribe of Dan, and then some loaned him some, some of their daughters to marry so that they wouldn't get wiped out. And then Dan moved way up to the north. 
So he's saying, like all the way from Dan to Beersheba, I'm going to remember the Lord. Here's what I'd like you to do. Here's your assignment this week. I, you know, I like to give assign. I like to give assignments. <laughs> My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you. Stop right there. Two lines. I want you to memorize those lines. Those are good lines. He says, my soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you. Now that isn't the logical therefore. The logical therefore, my soul is downcast, so I'm going to be a wimp, and I'm going to wander around and worry, and I'm going to have problems. And he changes the therefore. He says, therefore, I'm going to stop myself from that wrong thinking, and I'm going to begin to remember the Lord in my life. He goes on. He says, now, if you read verse 7, you might think, oh, he's dropping back to words of discouragement again. But no, he isn't. Look at verse 7. He says, deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. Now, what's he talking about there? Wait, we haven't gotten to verse yet, 8 yet. We might think he's talking about, oh, all of these troubles and trials have just swept over me. But no. You look at verse 8. He says, by day the Lord directs his love, and by night his song is with me. That word love there. Wonderful Hebrew word. It's the Hebrew word chesed. John's been trying to teach us that word. What's that word on judgment um, that you've been teaching? Cherem. And you got to say it with a harem, right? Same thing with this one. This is the word chesed. And then you got to give the guy that you're standing next to your hanky to kind of wipe your spit off his, off his face. Chesed. Chesed is covenant love. God's love for his people. Sometimes it's translated as mercy. So he's talking in verse 7 about God's mercy, God's love. Look how he describes that. Remember in verse 6, he says, I'm going to remember you. I'm going to remember your mercy. And here's he gets into a, a, a picture, word picture. He says, your love are like, do you, ever, do you ever go, sometimes, you know, waterfalls come and they drop, and they've they, they got a trail that you can kind of walk behind the waterfalls or even walk into the waterfall. Do you ever have that pouring on you, huh? Any of you got a particularly strong shower? Mine, mine, my shower. <laughs> mine makes it like a little trickle, trickling down. I mean, I can hardly get that shampoo and soap out of my hair, you know. But sometimes you can get these really strong showers, and you stand under there, whoa, whoa, wow, and you turn it up too hot, and whoa, whoa. David says that's what God's love is like. He just pours it out. God standing up there with a great big bucket of his chesed, chesed love, and he's pouring it out on David. He pours it out on us. His second analogy is, is all your waves and breakers have swept over me. I like taking a little kid. You take him out to Lake Michigan where there's even very little mild waves, and you get out just a little bit into the water, and this wave, maybe the wave to you is only this high, but to a little kid, that's a big wave, you know? And that wave comes along, and it hits the little kid, and, goes, and they fall down into the water. It over, it washes them, and knocks them right over. He says, God's love are like those breakers that have swept over me. I'm going to quit my whining and focusing in on the problems that are going around me, and I'm going to remember the Lord, and I'm going to remember his chesed love that he's just pouring out all over me. So his tune changes now. He found the cure for being downcast and discouraged. Focus on God and his mercy in our lives. He says, at night his song is with me. David knew the power of singing. Remember when David was young, he could play the harp, and Saul would always get depressed. Yeah, Saul would get depressed, so Saul found this young guy in his kingdom who could play the harp and, and sing, and David would come in, and David would play his harp, and Saul would, would, would be encouraged again. Singing encourages us. David knew that. 
David says, God, your love, this love that comes down like waterfalls and breakers on me, he says, he says, by day your love covers me, and at night your song calms me down and encourages me. I like to sing. I'm not good at it. I am loud. Back, I shared my testimony with you, how I, how I got saved, and a whole bunch of youth got saved at the same time, and and, and uh, we started a kind of a dynamic youth group, and we'd always start off with singing. One of the gals, Jan Rotman, could play the guitar, and we were learning a bunch of these choruses back in the 70s. You know, they were, they were some of the early contemporary Christian music back in the 70s, you know. And, uh, and uh, I was always loud. I loved the Lord, and I was singing it, and I was off tune, and I couldn't hold a note or the, you know, anything. And everyone would kind of look at me and give me dirty looks because I could, couldn't sing worth beans, but I was praising the Lord, you know. David says, at night his song is with me, singing to the Lord. Yeah, 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 calm down, quiet down a little bit, don't sing it so loud. No, I got to sing it loud. <laughs> Songs can really help us, can encourage our lives. So, verse 6, he's going to remember the Lord. He's going to remember the Lord's love, and he's going to allow the Lord to conquer that discouragement in his life. Let's go on. Now, notice this, dash, dash, a prayer to the God of my life. Kind of like it's ending this section, okay? This was my prayer. I conquered, I conquered my discouragement, and he ends that. This was a prayer to the God of my life, okay? Now, there was a problem. He had conquered. He had conquered his discouragement, but we don't know how much time went on between verse 8 and verse 9. Could have been just a few hours, maybe overnight. You know, I find that when I'm tired in the evening of the day, I tend to be more discouraged than I do in the morning. You know, this may be happened in the morning. We don't know. But then all of a sudden, some time went by and they drifted in again. His thoughts began to think about the problems of life. Oh, I didn't go through this. He stops himself abruptly. Why are you thinking this way? He began he begins to think about how good God is and God's mercies when we are discouraged and our mind runs wild. That's what his mind was doing. We need to stop ourselves and think of God's mercy. We need to meditate on the word of God. Psalm 119, a number of times already in Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hay have talked about meditating on God's word. We need to allow God's word to give us encouragement. Uh-oh, he drifted back again. Verse 9, I say to God, my rock. So he still calls him God, my rock. But then he starts with the questioning. Yeah, that's what happens when we get discouraged. We begin to question. He says, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? What happened? Well, I thought he had conquered discouragement. No, his mind drifted back again. Listen, we might conquer discouragement in our life for a time, but it will try to come back. Just like temptation, we may conquer a temptation once in our life, and we think, woohoo! I conquered that, I conquered that, I conquered that. No, it'll come back. It'll come back and tempt you again. Discouragement will try to come back in your life, and if you let it, he let it. He let his mind begin to wander. He began to think, huh, I wonder why God is putting me through all of these horrible things. And began. he began, you know what? Sometimes, sometimes there is honest, sincere questioning of God. Why? Sometimes. But most of the time when you're thinking in your mind, why, God, are you putting me through this? It's whining. It's whining, you know? I got a wife who says, quit your whining. Oh, but you're a, you're a nurse and you see people who got all kinds of problems and you don't appreciate the problems I got and I'll whine. And she says, quit your whining, you know? He's whining. 
He'd be getting, why have you forgotten me? Had God forgotten him? No. He really knew that, but he's whining. He's allowing the discouragement to creep into his life again. He begins to, he says, my bones suffer more. He's literally making himself sick with all of his discouragement and worry. His bones are aching. Oh, my bones ache. I wonder, I wonder if I got some dreadful, horrible disease and I'm going to die. Why? Why, God, have you brought this in my life? You know, he allowed himself to drift back into discouragement. Well, one more verse. He drifts back. Oh, I, got, I, I was put these after, after I preach it, I put a summary slide here. He drifts back to discouragement. David again allows his circumstances to occupy his thinking. He remembers those who taunt him. It is easy for our minds to turn again to the troublesome circumstances of our life instead of focusing on the mercy of God. That's easy for us to do. I got a, a New Testament illustration. I just throw these cross references in here. Remember the time when Jesus' disciples, Jesus went off to pray or stayed on shore for some reason, and his disciples were going across the uh, Sea of Galilee, and a big storm came up. Now, that, that, there was one where Jesus was sleeping in the boat, but this is another one. Big storm rolled up, and they're worried, and they're scared because, because their circumstances really look rough. And then all of a sudden, hey, wait, disciples, look, look out there. There's, a, there's somebody, he's walking on water. And as he got closer, they realized it was Jesus. And old, bold Peter, he says, hey, Jesus, if it's your will, let me come to you. And Jesus says, come. And Peter hops over the side of that, hops over the side of that boat. Huh, John, John was talking about our, our stage here. He hops over the side of that boat, and Peter is walking on water, and he's looking at Jesus, and he's walking right on that water, and he's thinking, wow, this is something. And then all of a sudden, Oh, wait, there's a big, strong wind, and there's a whole bunch of waves here. Here's the verse, Matthew chapter 14, starting here in the middle of verse 29, it says, So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. <coughs> what made him sink? He got his eyes off of Jesus and began to think of the circumstances around him again. That's just what our author in this psalm did again. He had conquered discouragement, and then he got his mind off the mercy of God and began to think about the circumstances around him again and began to be discouraged again. So he stops. He says in the last verse, he says, wait a minute. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Talking to himself again. The old uh, uh, golem who's arguing with himself here. He's pulling himself back to where he's supposed to be. Why so disturbed? With, why? You know, I'm questioning God. Why have you forgotten me? I'm the one who needs to be questioned. Why are you being downcast? Why are you being so disturbed? He says, put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. He pulls himself back. I don't know if you ever noticed your shampoo bottle. Some of them have it. They give you instructions, you know, like you don't know how to shampoo, huh? And they tell you to wet your hair. They tell you to get a good amount. Of course, they want you to use their bottle up really quick. So they tell you to get a good amount out of that shampoo bottle. And they say, lather thoroughly, you know, and you lather it all. And then they tell you, rinse it all out so all of the soap is out of your hair. And then the last instruction is, repeat as necessary. Yeah. And that's what David is doing here. Repeat as necessary. Anytime that discourage gets a hold of you again, I know, I know you conquered it once, you've conquered it twice, you've conquered it ten times, but that discouragement keeps coming back again. You need to talk to yourself and you need to say, and I, I say, I literally say this out loud at times. I say, stop it, John. And that's good because when I say that, I say, I say, who are you to tell me to stop it? <laughs> and I argue with myself. 
I said, you need to get a hold of yourself, and you need to stop thinking that way. You need to put those lusts out of your mind. You need to get that anger and put it away. You need to stop being so discouraged. You numbskull, quit it. I call myself names. Yeah, I deserve it. You numbskull, don't you know the mercies of God? Don't you know how good he is? Don't you know how much he's loved you? Don't you know that he wants to pour out his mercy like a waterfall on you? You need to stop being discouraged. I tell myself that. I'm in good company. David, if he's the author here, he told himself that too. The author here of this psalm told himself that. He says, wait a minute, why are you so downcast? You need to stop that kind of thinking and focus on how good God is to you. Oh, oh, I've stubbed my toe. You know, our, our, our problems that we blow up into great big things are nothing compared to some of the problems other people are going through, going through and are nothing compared to the mercy that God has in our lives. All right. He stops himself again. David again stops himself short. He repeats, he repeats the process of meditating on God's mercy and God's goodness. He literally tells himself to hope in God. He orders himself. Remember the imperative sentence. Put your hope, your trust in God. Do it and do it right now. You know, sometimes you got, some of you got some youth coming up. Huh? 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 Some of you got some youth coming up. And sometimes you need to get a little more firm. Even, even younger kids, you need to get a little more firm with them. Your dad, I remember saying this, your dad gave you something to do. And you need to go do it right now. You ever say something like? Do you ever say something like that as parents? Yeah, 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 yeah. We, we, yeah, yeah. We know how that goes, huh? He's doing that to himself. John, you need to stop that, and you need to stop that right now. You need to begin meditating on God's mercy, and you need to stop worrying about all of those problems, circumstances in your life, and focus on God. He tells himself that. He literally tells himself to hope in God. He orders himself to think correctly. I think there's a wonderful lesson in this psalm. When we begin to wander off and think about all of those horrible problems we got in life, we need to stop ourselves and focus on God. Here's a cross-reference, Habakkuk. If, I don't know, is it, is it okay, John, to have a favorite verse? I mean, all of the Bible is inspired by God, you know. And there's a lot of, you know, what's your life verse? A lot of people say, oh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, you know. Here's our, these, are, I think, are some of my favorite verses. Habakkuk 3, verses 17, 18, and 19. Habakkuk says this. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes in the vine. Now, remember, they were in an agricultural society. When your figs did not grow, you didn't have any money for the year. Farmers, they don't earn a weekly paycheck, or they don't earn a bi-weekly paycheck. They got to wait till harvest season, take the crops in before they get anything from that. Pay off the loans that they had to live on while be, the crop was growing. He says here, though the fig tree does not bud and there's no, grain, there's no grapes on the vines, uh-oh, life is going to be rough. Though the olive crop fails... And the fields produce no food, and though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, life is rough, huh? If Habakkuk stopped and focused on these things, he would get discouraged. But this is what he says. He says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God my Savior. Isn't that a neat verse? Even though I got all these problems in life, I'm going to still rejoice in the Lord. I'm going to stop myself from worrying. I'm going to rejoice 
It's interesting. I compared the two Hebrew words. He says, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my Savior. They're very similar. They're separate, two separate Hebrew words. But one, one, one is more the action of, of outward rejoicing. The other is kind of focusing more in on the, on the, on the meditating, on the, on, on the goodness of God and joy, experiencing joy. One's an outward expression. The other's an inward expression enjoyment of God. We need to enjoy God. I like verse 19. He says, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Now Habakkuk is talking about a particular kind of deer um, they don't know whether it is at a mountain goat or not, but we see pictures of the mountain goats. Now, I had to crop this picture to put it in here, but if you saw the whole picture, they're standing on the top of a great big mountain with sheer cliffs all around them. And look at look at what they're doing. They're standing right on top of the rocks. And if you ever see any of these National Geographic videos of the mountain goats, they're jumping around and leaping, and if they slipped once, they'd fall a thousand feet and be smashed to pieces, but they don't care. They're still jumping around, and they're standing on the, on, on the rocks and the crags that could cause them problems. Habakkuk says, the Lord's going to give me feet like that. And even though I have all kinds of problems in my life, I'm going to stand on top of them and overcome them and rejoice in the Lord. That's what I want to leave you with today. It is so easy to drift back into, woe is me thinking. We need to stop ourselves from the negative, discouraging thinking and redirect our thoughts to God's mercy. Meditate on his love. Meditate on his word. Allow him to encourage us again. And we need to do this as often. Repeat as necessary. Repeat this. Every time discouragement comes into our lives, we need to stop ourselves, redirect our thinking and focus on God's mercy. It will give you victory over discouragement and problems in your life. Let's bow in prayer.